and we are going to be talking about aggression tonight. <clears throat> For those who don't know Ted, he is a trainer who's up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, up uh, up north from us here in Buffalo. And um, Ted's been training dogs probably around the same amount of time that I have. In fact, we met seven years ago at a seminar, and we've been buds ever since. And um, Ted does amazing work. And uh, if you're not familiar with him, definitely check him out. He's on Facebook. He's on YouTube. Um, but tonight we're going to be talking about aggression. He's got a master class coming up uh, for anybody who's interested in learning more. So um, we will be taking questions from our viewers. So if you're out there watching this on Facebook or YouTube, feel free to put questions in the comments section. And uh, But just to kick it off, Ted, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, – how you got started working with aggressive dogs and why you've sort of gravitated towards that. What is it that's, that draws you into that discipline? Sure. So I, I've been training dogs for over a decade now. And when I was new in the dog training industry, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just knew that I wanted to train dogs I loved working with my own dogs. I loved helping people at the park for free with their dogs. And when I opened my first company, I started to get phone calls from people saying, hey, I got your name and phone number from your Facebook or whatever, and could you help me with my aggressive dog? And I honestly would just reply to them, I don't know. I've never worked with an aggressive dog before. I have no idea. But if you're that hard up for a trainer, and there was very few trainers back then, it was me and maybe two other trainers, I'll help you for free. And if I can help you, feel free to give me some money. And that's literally how I cut my teeth for a long time, like at least a year and a half before I even started charging for it. I was kind of lucky that I, I had a bit of a knack for it. I had some good fundamentals from my kind of history and working with protection dogs and drug detection and, and pet dogs and stuff. And so it came to me pretty naturally. But I just started getting people calling me, asking me for it. And then when I actually started like helping these people and getting testimonials and putting that, those on my website, it was like, okay, well, clearly this is the guy to call if I have an aggressive dog in this area. And I was also very lucky that I absolutely loved it. Like there is nothing that I like as much as working with reactive and aggressive dogs. Um, and so I just got really lucky that people, there was a market searching for something that I didn't even know I could do. I filled that market. And then I actually developed a passion to the luckiest person in the world. So now you do, so just be clear, you don't only do aggression, of course. You also do a lot of off-leash training and obedience stuff. Uh, but aggression has been sort of your mainstay and, and been one of the things that um, that you've been, I think, most interested about just in, in knowing you and, and the work that you've done over the years. What are some of the, like, um, what do you think are, like, some of the, the, the early mistakes that you made when you were just starting out working with aggressive dogs? <laughs> I don't know what you're implying right now, Tyler. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so how much time do we have? Uh, I think that fundamentally, I was also very lucky that I had worked with protection dogs previously. And anybody who's worked with any type of uh, sport dog or protection dog knows the insane amount of power behind their jaws. Anytime you do bite work, put on a sleeve, put on a suit, you know, you've done this and you have, you know, you have a Malinois. So you know how much power there is behind those, those teeth. And I was very lucky that I experienced that. I went through that before I started working with aggressive dogs because I had an insatiable amount of fear um, towards not being bitten. Now, I oftentimes hear trainers say, oh, it's just part of the game. You're going to be bitten all the time. It just is what it is. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't mean to sound, you know, cross or anything, but it shouldn't be that way. I've been bitten one time. I work with aggressive dogs every day. Um, but I don't know. For me, the big thing is that I think a lot of people just go into it with the 
expectation that they're going to be bitten or there's going to be dog fights all the time or whatever. And I, I don't think that that should be realistic. I'd say the worst thing that I did was the one time that I was bitten, um, I assumed that the dog was not going to try to bite me and he did, which basically means I tell every trainer that comes to shadow me or comes to a seminar or anything like that. The first thing that I tell them is if you are going to work with aggressive dogs, rule number one is every dog that you work with, if even if you're not touching that dog's leash, if you're in proximity to an animal, you expect that dog is going to try to bite you. 99% of the time, you're not going to have that dog try to bite you if you're doing the right things you're not agitating the dog but that one percent of the time when you're not expecting it you'll be prepared and i wish i would have known that earlier in my career because then i wouldn't have been bitten that that first time yeah that makes a lot of sense you know i actually kind of had the opposite um situation i um i worked with aggressive dogs before i ever was around a protection dog um and, and, um, I, you know, it definitely makes sense to me what you're saying. Cause I, I got bit a lot in the beginning because I was too bold. I didn't have that healthy fear in place yet. And, you know, fear is a, is a, a powerful learning device in many ways, but the, the lessons sure. created from fear become so ingrained into like, you know, the lizard brain, um, and things become more instinctual when you've been able to feel that. Um, and I just want to, point out I, I i apologize if anybody can hear this in the background i muted my mic at one point i just fed my dogs and lobo is in the room with me and he just threw up like all of his food in the corner and oh you know, poor guy all like undigested food so it's just like food and then he just ate the entire pile of it so it was really disgusting uh, but that's um that's like yay we're doing this live and that's really nice. <laughs> and uh so i apologize if you could hear that at all i think he's done and we can move on um but also what you were saying reminded me a bit um i remember i went to a chad mackin seminar many many years ago and it was a socialization seminar and he used to say at the beginning of the workshops he used to say treat every dog here like it's a trained fighter um and you know he's doing these socialization workshops where presumably if people are right. coming they um, have issues with their dog being social. And, um, and yeah, so, yeah, yeah it, was, it was wise advice. We've got a whole bunch of people jumping on here, commenting, saying hello. Uh, Blake's here, which is awesome. Um, and, uh, yeah, we have one question that came in already here from our viewers. And I'm going to throw this on the screen so you guys can see it. Um, and this is from, uh, it says Coco Ann. It says, what is the difference between aggressively being reactive on leash? So I guess sort of like, is there a difference? And then if there is, what is it? Sorry, you broke up a little bit there, but I think I got the question. So okay. Coco Ann, um, in, in reality, the way that I determine reactivity and aggression, this is just the way I uh, give it terminology as I say reactivity is, barking, growling, lunging, those types of behaviors. Um, but there's not really intention to, you know, physically hurt another dog, a person, etc. cetera. Uh, aggression is barking, growling, lunging, these types of behaviors, and there is actual intention. So they look very, very similar. And even a trained specialist, uh, in my estimation, is not going to be good enough to see the difference between a reactive dog and aggressive dog 100% of the time. I'm clearly not. Um, so what I would say is when it comes down to it, the vast majority of dogs, at least the way that I see them on a leash are reactive, not aggressive. The intention is not really to hurt. Um, for the most part, really the only way that you could actually tell the difference is to let that dog off a leash and see what actually ends up happening. But in reality, most dogs who have reactivity are just frustrated. They're pissed off. They're full of piss and vinegar. They're being restrained. There's other dogs barking, growling, giving them eyes from across the street. And so a lot of times it's just this, this frustration that's building up, you know, through hundreds, thousands of repetitions and it's not really an aggressive thing. It's just frustration. And, you know, with frustration comes reactivity. So most dogs are not actually aggressive. But the only way to tell the difference is, is, okay, if you let that dog off, is he going to start a fight? Now, there's a caveat. 
there's a lot of dogs that are reactive that if you actually let them off of the leash, it would look like they're starting a fight when they're not actually starting a fight. So when a dog has so much frustration that they're just like bouncing off the walls, if you drop the leash and they ran over to another dog, it would look like there's an almost automatic fight. The problem is, is that the dog running over towards another dog, even though he's running over there, it looks like he's going to start a fight. But there's a stationary dog there who's going, oh, my God, there's a dog running at me as fast as he can. And so that's why there's this whole you know, this whole argument that happens if a dog even gets off and then it turns into a fight. So most dogs that are actually reactive, if you let them off, they're going to run over so fast and they're full of so much frustration that the dog who's on the leash still is going to be like, whoa, I can't deal with this frustration. And then you're going to have a fight actually ensue when really the dog who's got the frustration, the reactivity, if he runs over there, that's not really an intention. This is what I call a dog that looks at other dogs like a treadmill, like a tennis racket, something like that, right? They don't, most reactive dogs do not look at other dogs like their own species. They look at them like a way to get to a higher state of arousal. And so a lot of dogs look very aggressive because they just do socially ridiculous things that can get them into fights and arguments and whatever. And then they get deemed reactive really for the most part for the most part they're just frustrated and if they had some better coping mechanisms they'd actually be able to coexist in the world a lot better and not end up in these fights in the first place yeah that makes a lot of sense and i, I mean i think it's worth mentioning here that um you know the Sure. Sorry, guys. I was still muted from my dog. Um, I should have audio <laughs> back again. <laughs> Let me repeat everything I just said. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, what I was going to say is um, I think it's worth noting that the um, concept of aggression is one of those things that if you talk to 10 different dog trainers, you're going to get 10 different definitions of aggression. Um, and so what's important here is not so much, you know, what is aggression versus what is reactivity, but rather for the purposes of our conversation or when we are working together, if I say aggression, this is what I mean. If I say reactivity, this is what I mean. So at least we can have a dialogue and, um, and, you know, have a productive conversation. So it's not, it's not so much like you may talk to somebody else and they may define things differently and that's okay. That's perfectly fine. Um, but at least we know when, you know, for the purposes of this conversation, or if somebody is, um, you know, going to go through the master class with Ted, that's great information to have. So if he says aggressive, this dog is aggressive, you know exactly what he means versus this dog is right. reactive. Um, and we'll post a link to the master class that he's doing here. Ted's doing a, um, a master class on aggression. We'll talk about that a little bit more in detail towards the end of the stream here. So you guys can have um, some information about that. But I believe it starts on Thursday. Is that correct, Ted? Yeah, it does. Two days. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So we've got some other questions coming in here. Let me scroll back because there's a whole bunch of comments of people um, talking about how they couldn't hear me. Uh, let's see here. Give me one second. Do -do 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 -do. Lost Tyler sound. Lost Tyler so sound. So maybe before. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Maybe before you go through any questions, uh, maybe you could stipulate your your definitions of reactivity and aggression. Sure. Yeah. So um, for me, um, when I talk about aggression, I use kind of the definition that's used by a lot of ethologists. Um, and in the world of ethology, aggression is any behavior that is geared towards um, hurting, harming, killing or scaring away a conspecific. Conspecific means member of the same species. And except with dogs, I expand that out to um, other species because dogs live with 
different species. Like right. many animals only live with their own species, right? So, yeah. um, and it's specific, these things geared towards a con specific because to an ethologist, uh, predatory behavior is actually not considered aggression. It's just considered like it's part of life. It's, it's necessary for survival. So, uh, um, right, so right. I use that definition and that's not the only definition, but that's just the definition that I tend to roll with, um, uh, when I'm talking okay. about aggression. And so to me, aggression and reactivity aren't necessarily like an either or. Um, like a dog can be both aggressive and highly reactive. So to me, reactivity right. has more to do with like the, the temperament and the way the dog responds to the environment. Cause for instance, you can have an aggressive dog that is very calm and stable, but you know, does like sneak attacks, right? Um, like we get a lot of like very powerful, confident Rottweilers that are like this, like they're not what I would call reactive mm. dogs at all. Um, for sure. It's, it's, it's the silence that's sort of like the warning signal with them. Um, but I've get dogs that are reactive that are also aggressive, you know, but they're like, they're sort of like, you know, um, on a, on a quick trigger, you know what I mean? Like they're very explosive and, and yeah. very dynamic in their temperament. So often though, when we're talking about leash reactivity, um, we don't know. So I, I fully agree with Ted in that context. We get many people that come to us. They say, my dog is dog aggressive. Okay. Well, what does he do? Well, when we're on walks, he lunges and barks and blah, blah. Well, we don't actually know if he is like truly dog aggressive because it could just be frustration. We don't know where this behavior is coming from, but if part of the behavior is uh, motivated by the desire, even just to scare away the other dog or keep that dog away, then under my definition, that would still be qualified as aggressive behavior. Right. right? Okay. Uh, but again, it's like, it's not, it's, it's more just like, let's just make sure we know what we're talking about kind of things. Cause some people you say aggressive and they think the dog wants to kill everybody. And other people you say aggressive and it's like the dog barks out the window. Right. Or I've had some people yeah. say my dog is aggressive. What do you mean? And it's like, they say, Oh, well he plays really aggressively right? Like yeah. kind of pushy is considered aggressive to them, like an aggressive salesman, right? Like he's not trying to hurt <laughs> you, but he's just really intense about his sales practice. So anyhow, that's, that's kind of how I do it. Um, this is a great question that came in from Lauren Turner. And she asks, what are some of the top safety tips you have for working with aggressive dogs? Um, Ted, as she notes, has a really, really awesome safety record. And I know in a lot of your shadow programs in the past, and you've posted videos on some of the safety protocols that you do. That's been a big focus of yours. So I think that's an excellent question. What are the top, the top safety tips you have for working with aggression? Uh, so one of the one of the things I always suggest, and I kind of mentioned it earlier, is that I would highly suggest if you want to work with aggressive dogs, even if you're not, I think it's it's good to have a healthy fear of dogs. But go find a police canine handler. Go find a should. Club that's going to put a sleeve or put you in a suit and have a dog bite you. I highly recommend it because it will give you a different view of how powerful a dog actually is. That would be the first thing that I would suggest. That's not really safety, but it's, you know, it, you know, a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit goes a long way as far as, as, as far as having some respect for what can happen if things go wrong. Um, so that would be one thing that I would do. I would go and work with shelter, uh, you know, people that work in shelters as well, too. You know, they've got dogs coming in and out and whatever. Go to some vets and ask if, if there's anything that they can tell you. There's simple little things that I've learned in the past. One of the things that my mentor did with me a long time ago, Duke Ferguson, he took a, a big jug of water, a four gallon jug of water, or however, four liters, sorry, we're, we're in Canada. And, um, and he, he attached a long line to it and he took this jug at about 20 feet from me. So say like, I don't know, a little bit further than, than where the wall is. And he just threw that jug at me as, as fast as he could. And he showed me how to do simple things like how to soak up the leash and to move it out to the side. He showed me actual techniques like that. Like, and he started out with simple, like, I'm going to, I'm going to lob it to you real slow and you need to get out of the way and you need to learn how to, you know, move away. He taught me simple things like when you've got a large dog. So if a dog goes up on their hind legs, you can't go up like this because they're just going to bite your hand or your arm, depending on how tall you are. So he taught me ways of being able to, uh, you know, uh, to get out of the way. I would say when you're er earlier in your career, I know I did this a lot in the past. 
I used a lot of muzzles in the first couple of years. I used fences. I used crates. I used a lot of those things until I learned how to read dogs very well. Um, and uh, those are the things that come off of the top of my head. But sometimes people think that it's like it's I don't know, it's disingenuous to like practice. Like, what are you going to do if a dog comes at you? And trust me, I've had dogs come at me many times, sometimes with muzzles, sometimes without muzzles, because I screwed up. I misread the dog. That was my fault. But I've only ever been bitten the one time because I was not prepared. Um, whereas if you're prepared and you know some of the techniques and a dog comes running at you, it's a lot easier for you to be able to go, oh, oh, he's coming. And now I can go or I can go up, uh, whatever you need to do. When a dog is in close proximity, I typically will just take the leash and I will use my thumb and index finger and I will just use it as a, I don't know, a fulcrum or whatever they call that. And I'll basically just go like this. I'll go up, up and out with my hand like this. And then the dog is going to be underneath me um, and they can't get it at me. If the dog is very long dog, um, uh, maybe a really big boxer or a big shepherd or something, I know that if I go up like this, he's probably going to try to bite my arm. And so I have to go out to the sides and that's just the only things that you can do. But I'd say start with a healthy fear. That's the most important thing to do. Go out and ask people that are like in the trenches, like veterinarians, people that work at rescues, you know, ask other trainers that you work with, what's a... You know, what's one thing that you wish that you knew or whatever, and then operate under the premise that we talked about before, which is assume every dog is going to try to bite you. And I can't tell you how many dog trainers I know who've been bitten so many times. The vast majority of the time it's from small dogs that are just unassuming and they just, the people let their guards down and it happens. And then six months goes by and it happens again and it happens again and it happens again because people get People get comfortable with these things happening, especially if it's a small dog. Oh, the dog's not going to be able to really hurt me that bad or whatever. But a small dog biting you on the hand can put you out of work for a couple of months, especially if it gets infected. So you have to assume that every dog is going to try to bite you. And I guarantee that's going to cut down the amount of times you get bitten by, like literally, it's like if you're decent at reading dogs, it's going to cut cut it down by like 99%. Like, I don't know. That's all I can say is just assume it's going to happen because you'll be prepared for it and then you can at least act. But most people are bitten when they're not when they're not expecting it. Let's put it that way. Your thoughts, Tyler? Yeah, I mean, I think that's all great advice. I was so I'd actually um, be curious to hear your thoughts because um, you mentioned briefly, you know, you've been bitten or you've, you've had dogs lunge at you sometimes with muzzles on, without muzzles on. How frequently do you you use muzzles? Are you a are you a big proponent of muzzles? Do you try to avoid using them? I know some trainers are all over the board on this topic. Yeah. So very good question. I, the first thing that I would say is I almost never use muzzles. I don't think I've used a muzzle in years. But I would absolutely not suggest that for somebody who's just starting out or is at a, let's say, moderate level of working with dogs. I've rehabilitated over 1,000, maybe 1,500 dogs at this point. I've been doing it for a long time. I do not suggest doing that until you are very, very skilled at dog reading and have done this for a very long time. Um, so... I don't really use them and I'll tell you the reason why, because I firstly, I am good enough at reading dogs now where if, if something is going to go awry, I'm probably going to be prepared and I'm going to be able to read it and I'm always going to know, I'm always going to be expecting something's going to happen. But I don't use them for one very basic principle and I don't know if you would uh, agree with this, but for me, it just comes down to this. Muzzles change the dog's behavior so incredibly much. And for me to do muzzle training is going to take me twice or three times as long as if I don't use a muzzle. So for me, it's just I'm just not prepared to take twice or three times as much time to get to where I need to be because most dogs don't like having them on. And then they just sit around and mope and then they just try to get it off and then they're trying to scratch it and 
I know lots of people who say, well, you got to do this muzzle conditioning for two, three weeks below and whatever. I don't know about you, but I've seen dogs that have gone through months of muzzle conditioning and they still sit in the socialization field slumped like this with their head against the fence and they don't want to go anywhere. So I don't use them because it changes the dog behavior so much, but I would never suggest to a younger trainer not to do that. And I say that specifically because I know some more seasoned trainers who have said to me and other trainers in the past, if you have to use a muzzle, you don't know what you're doing. And I think that is the stupid, stupidest, most arrogant thing that a seasoned trainer could say to a younger trainer. Listen, we've all used muzzles. There's nothing wrong with it. You know, and and heck, tomorrow I might end up using one. I've always got them there just in case I need them. But I usually don't use them because, again, it changes the behavior so much that it ends up taking me a lot longer. Yeah, that's um, so that's a good response. You know, we at our training center, we don't use them ourselves very frequently. Um, and I would say the reason for that is just because as you get more proficient at working with aggressive dogs, you get better at reading them and avoiding pushing them to the point where they would try to bite you. So it becomes often just not a necessity for us. Um, but yeah. again, if you're newer and you don't have the guidance of somebody that you're working for to kind of supervise and, and keep things safe, then absolutely use a muzzle. Um, we use them a lot actually though with our clients, but a lot of times it's actually to help the humans overcome their anxiety so that they can feel comfortable going into the situations that they wouldn't otherwise do. Um, we yeah. obviously try our best to condition the dogs to the muzzle to, to mitigate the change in behavior that can occur. And, and that's always something that you need to be aware of. But I, I think definitely for us, um, one of the really big reasons that we turn to muzzles a lot is to help the people to overcome their, um, uh, their anxieties. And, um, yeah, yeah. So I think that's, that's super important, but absolutely. If you're just starting out, if, if you're, if you're not comfortable working aggression and it's new to you then muzzle the dog. It's not worth it. Um, it's, it's just not worth it for you. It's not worth it for the dog. Things will go smoother with a muzzle on. Um, we had two questions here that are kind of related. So one, um, and I read them and there are different spots on my feed here, but one is something along the lines of, is it possible to rehabilitate leash reactivity um, with positive methods and specifically asking about like using rewards to kind of like distract the dog or do like a look at me kind of thing. And then the other one, and this is why they're kind of related, different questions, but related is how would you deal with a dog who's, um, so, uh, so jumpy that any form of physical correction causes him to fly over threshold, whether it be e-collar, uh, leash pressure, any kind of physical correction makes the dog um, kind of becomes a catalyst for the dog's explosiveness. So you can take those however you want to, but they sort of tie into each other. Okay. Um, just writing those down because I, I tend to forget. So first and foremost, like, I, I am a balanced trainer, but that does not mean I am so close minded that I don't think that you can work with leash reactive dogs in different ways. Like, there are people who've trained Schutz and three dogs that are some high ranking dogs with 100% force free methods. Okay. And people said for many, many years, you cannot do it. The same thing can be said for leash reactivity. My personal view and you, you know, it, this is just a personal view. My personal view is it takes way longer for the average trainer and owner to be able to get a leash reactive dog to be able to walk down the street without acting like a psychopath with only positive methods. Okay. Now I know that some people would disagree with that and they would say, no, that's not accurate. Or they would come at it the other way and they would say, well, wait a second. But if it's, if it's shorter, then that means you're putting too much pressure on the dog and longer actually means it's gentler and whatever. And, and, and that's, and that's fine and dandy. My thought process is this, listen, I love working with dogs. I do whatever I can to be um, helpful and to, you know, to be a good steward of, of, of the time that I'm spending with the dog. But really at the end of the day, I got to get people results in a reasonable amount of time, you know, and six months to a year to get a dog to walk down the road without acting crazy is very, I don't know. It's just, it's not for me. 
The other thing that I would say is, is that there are a lot of people who would suggest, hey, you're going to use these positive methods and, and, and they work, but in reality, they're not positive methods, right? So for example, you can look at a gentle leader, you can look at head collars, and there's videos out there of people saying this is positive only training, and yet they're just, you know, pulling up on the dog's head, forcing it to look at the owner, feed, 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 feed. That is not positive reinforcement training. So strict force-free training, yeah, it can happen. I think at least for the majority of dogs, but again, it comes down to how long are you willing to invest in it? And I can't speak for you, but I was a struggling dog owner with a dog who had all kinds of problems and he was terrible on the leash and he couldn't go off leash because all he wanted to do was kill things. And I went through the force free stuff. And if I would have given it a year, a two years, three years, I may have been able to get a reasonable amount of the way there, but I just wasn't able to do it after six months. It was just like, I'm moving these incremental steps. Like this is just, this is ridiculous how much time I'm putting into this. So I would sum that all up and saying, and I'd love to hear Tyler's view on it. Yeah, you can do it. I'm not going to be closed minded and say you can't do it, but it comes down to how much time are you willing to invest? And for me, my clients, like they're so sick of doing a lot of my clients come in, they've worked with three, four, five other trainers. They've been working at leash activity for years and I can get them usually in a, you know, much better state in a couple of weeks or a month. And to them, that's like, it's, that's worth everything. Yeah. Um, I'll chime in there. And, um, you know, I definitely agree like for, uh, Hey Bill, what's up, man? Um, I definitely agree. Um, you know, for a lot of people that the time factor is huge. And I think that's the one thing that gets lost often in discussions about methodology is it's not about what, you know, you or I as professionals can accomplish. It's about, you know, the average person who, you know, has a job and kids and everything else and, and what they're going to be able to accomplish on their own. I think the one thing that's really worth um, mentioning though, is kind of within that question. And I apologize. It wasn't an exact quote because it was somewhere in the stream. Um, but, um, it was, you know, can the positive methods work such as teaching the dog to look at you and um, redirection? And, you know, I think one of the issues is that um, a lot of trainers don't use reward-based training properly when they're dealing with aggression. Um, I don't personally think teaching a dog to just look at you whether it's with a reward or with an e-collar or with anything else is long-term going to be a very successful path to rehabilitation. It's a good management strategy. It's yeah. not like a bad thing to do. It can, it can help you through a sticky situation if you could at least maintain focus, but it's not necessarily um, going to be a, 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 a smooth path towards rehabilitation. Um, Sure. I, I think, you know, like I know, Ted, you're really big on counter conditioning and um, you do a lot of like the sort of existential um, feeding kind of stuff as well to sort of aid in that. And I think, you know, spending time as a trainer, becoming more proficient in counter conditioning can take you a lot farther than trying to use like a treat to just hold your dog's focus. Um and yeah. so that's kind of my two cents on that. But like Ted, I'm a balanced dog trainer. I'm a balanced dog trainer for a reason. And it's because when you're sort of in the trenches doing this stuff um, and you want to have a high, high rate of success and be able to help as many people as possible, it just makes more sense to give them the available tools to achieve their goals. Um, I think we always have to remember that when we are dog trainers, we have to be concerned about the well-being and stress of two species the dog and the human. Um, exactly. and I think that's another thing that gets way overlooked is that sometimes um, in the efforts to create a positive experience for the dog, the human ends up suffering quite a bit um, and struggling and being stressed and being frustrated. And all of that can also be damaging to the relationship between the human and the dog. So of course, these are broad statements. Um, there are, of course, cases that can be resolved totally with positive reinforcement very quickly. Um, yeah. And there are some trainers that are more successful at doing this than others. I think if your goal is to be successful with the broadest amount of people and the broadest amount of dogs, then opening up your toolbox um, to a variety of approaches, which includes 
reward-based approaches. Uh, we use a lot of reward-based technique in our rehabilitation, um, but also keeps the door open to, you know, using various forms of negative reinforcement um, and whatnot, you know, as needed um, to get the most efficient, um, you know, the most efficient solution. I think that's our obligation as professionals is to provide people with a treatment that we know to be effective. And if you look at the medical community, failure to provide, you know, treatment that's known to be effective is actually can get you, you know, can get your, your license pulled. Um, so I think, you know, as, <laughs> as animal trainers, we should, we should hold ourselves to the same standard. Right. Um, yeah. yes, you know, to also be fair, um, a lot of the, the things I said about a lot of, tr of trainers, not necessarily using reward based techniques properly. And that's why maybe the results are mixed. A lot of those same things can be lofted at, um, trainers who use e-collars or prong collars. There are certainly, I've seen it over and over again. I know, Ted, you've yeah. seen this teaching seminars where people, I get clients coming all the time that they have the prong collar, they have the e-collar, they've been to a bunch of trainers with them. It's not working because they're only being told to basically just nail the dog anytime the dog lashes out. There's no real connection or communication about you know the animal's emotional experience and, and sort of how to work them through this. Um, and so it doesn't really matter what the tool is like that, like the same criticisms of treats can be thrown at e-collars and the same criticisms of e-collars can be thrown at treats. What it boils down to is as a professional, I think being proficient in all the available tools and then knowing when and where to apply each one in a, in a fair way to achieve the best goal with the least amount of stress for all, you know, for all parties involved. I think that's kind of the big, the big thing is how, is how do we accomplish that, um, and, and be efficient about it. So. That was my, that's my soapbox sure. rant about the issue. <laughs> um, so let's see what else we got here. Let me pull this question off the screen. And no, I agree, man. Here. Cool, cool. Um, what about the, the question about the dog being too jumpy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so let's jump back into that. So then the other kind of follow through was how do you deal with, um, this is from a different person, but I thought that kind of tied in. How do you deal with the dog? Um, and it looks like our stream cut out for a second, probably just bad internet. Um, how do you deal with a dog that... Uh, goes over threshold with any form of correction. So whether it's an e-collar or leash pressure, if he's a reactive type dog, yeah. when you do try to correct him, he goes over threshold. And the reason I, I've tied those together is because of course, one option is to, hey, maybe this is a dog that we should spend a little bit of time and try the positive route with. But of course, I think there are other um, ways of looking at this as well. So I'll let you kind of take it from there. Okay, and I'd love to hear your your thoughts on this because these dogs are pretty relatively rare. I've seen them almost exclusively with pitties and staffy mixes. I've also seen uh, some boxers be this way, and I've seen uh, some high drive, typically like police line shepherds uh, being this way. So the 95% of the time when I see it, it's one of those breeds or mixes or some sort of a variant. Um, there seems to be some sort of a genetic component to this as well. Um, so the first thing that I would suggest is definitely look into something like condition relaxation, which honestly, I, I don't mean to sound demeaning, is essentially massaging the dog, getting them to calm down. I think that these dogs naturally tend to be way too overstimulated and easily stimulated and so not taking the dog for walks um, until they're able to actually like walk down the driveway and not be overstimulated is very key typically when i see dogs like this they are walking around like psychopaths with a chainsaw just vroom, vroom, like this just walking around the neighborhood like this and then the and then the client says, "Oh man, I you know I pulled the leash and oh I just exploded." A lot of times these dogs redirect too, right? So you have to watch that, and that can be a situation where a muzzle is is helpful. But basically, what I tell people is, listen, the state of mind is what's making the dog as over you know easily stimulated as they are, and there's a genetic propensity for them to get into this way, and so. The first thing, like I said, I, I would practice relaxation. I would practice, okay, the walk is not about you going around hunting for things. It's not about you getting too excited or overstimulated. I'd be watching the dog's uh, pupils to see how dilated they are. I'd be watching the dog's tail, their muscle tension in their back legs. 
I'd be watching for their hair standing up. We'd be watching for all these classic signs that the dog is escalating in excitement. And what I would do is I would not let the dog go past a specific threshold. Now, the thing that people oftentimes forget is, is that these dogs are not always overstimulated. A lot of times people bring me dogs like this and they go, it doesn't matter what happens. If I give him a correction, he freaks out, he redirects at me, whatever the case is. The problem is that's not accurate. The, the issue is that the dog gets over threshold easier than the average dog. And then it starts to have these issues where it starts to fight and battle and, and get, you know, so easily simulated. The thing that you have to do is you just have to back it up a few steps. If you walk to the front door and go to put a leash on your dog and he doesn't sit and you give him a pop, he doesn't come up the leash and try to eat you. He doesn't freak out and lose his mind. He doesn't do those things. It's only when you're halfway up the driveway, right? So you have to understand where it is where the dog's state of mind actually changes. For some dogs, it's the front steps. For some dogs, it's halfway down your driveway. For some dogs, it's the end of your driveway. For some dogs, it's the end of the street before the dog gets so oversatiated that they're that they're so easily stimulated that everything turns into just a you know dramatic mess or the dog redirecting or whatever. So I will start with these dogs. Just massage them down at the door, get them to calm down. If they start escalating, a little bit of pressure, oftentimes with like a slip lead, sometimes a uh, like a dominant dog collar can be very helpful here. A little bit of pressure up, get them to calm down. A little bit of pressure down until they start actually doing that. And that might be the first week. You don't even go for a walk. We just go in and out of the door a little bit, and you got to be calm there. Because if you can't fix how the dog is walking up your driveway, you're never going to be able to fix him when you're actually like walking on the street and there's another dog there. But you got to strip it back. It might even be all the way to before you even leave your house. And I hate giving that advice because it's so hard for clients to take it because they don't want to hear that. They want to hear just, oh, here's this quick little thing that you can do when you go for a walk. But apart from putting a massive level of pressure on a dog um, in that environment, there's nothing else that works. That's just my personal opinion. Yep. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you touched on a lot of important things there. I think probably for me, like the key thing is focusing on that excitement and arousal issue. Um, you know, it's that's often the culprit arousal is, is often the, um, you know, the, the demon that is behind a lot of these bad behaviors, especially out on walks. So focusing on that quite a bit. The other thing I would say is, especially when you're talking about, you know, um, using the leash, right. Um, maybe backing up a step and just going back to some of the fundamentals of teaching your dog, um, leash pressure communication and making sure that they view the leash as a communication tool, not as a restriction or as just a correction. So it's a tool that when they feel it, they sense it's you checking in with them. It's you sort of speaking to them. Um, and mm -hmm. um, I think that can be super helpful. But the other thing I think also is just, you know, okay, if this is a dog that we, we do feel like we need some form of, you know, correction, right? Like this is a, this is a situation where, where we don't feel like we can go the, the positive route um, or at least not exclusively the positive route it might just be worth experimenting with different forms of correction. So, um, you know, I, I preach this a lot in my, um, content that I put out there. Um, I, I like to be very experimental with different forms of correction because just like you'll get different responses from a dog with different forms of reinforcement, right? Like dog will, you'll get one reaction from a dog using a toy reinforcer or food or different types of food. Um, same goes for corrections. And for some dogs you can get, this way like overreactive jumpy response to a leash or to an e-collar, but you get the exact perfect response with a squirt bottle or with some yeah. kind of noise maker or with compressed air. So it's sometimes it's like if, if, if you're getting that reaction from the dog, maybe that's just not the right tool for that dog. And, um, it's quite possible that with some experimentation, you know, you can find a different tool that would work. You know what I mean? That, that would be more effective for you. But I think, you know, definitely if, if you're getting that reaction, the one thing you don't want to do is just keep at it. And then definitely the one thing you yeah. really don't want to do is go harder. You know, that's, that's kind yeah. of the thing that I think a lot of people, um, you know, the big flaw a lot of people make is they get so married to like, I love my e-collar or I love my prong collar that, 
even when it's not giving them an effective result, the only real option is, well, it must not have been a strong enough correction. Um, and that generally right. is only going to make things worse. So we definitely don't want to do that. Backing up a little bit, working on, you know, focusing on the dog's arousal levels, um, even prior to them seeing whatever triggers their aggression is going to go a real long way. You know, that's going to go a real so, long way. So let me add a, a, a little thing there too, because I, I love what you said about having kind of more tools in the toolbox. Uh, I, I would say I probably use prong collars and e-collars more than anything else, but I have, have like my box I use in everything that is out there, and I would totally agree with you. These dogs tend to be very easily stimulated by anything uh, physical, and so that's why I had mentioned using a dominant dog collar or a slip lead because typically when dogs are very easily physically stimulated those tools will will help to decompress them it will where most tools will actually give them more energy so a pop on a prong will set them off usually if you have a if you have a tightly fitted collar and you just go nice and slow with it and just let them down it will de-escalate them a little bit so that's one of the things that uh, I like to use for those types of dogs. And another thing I like to do too, is just strip it back and just go, okay, so you're just going to do long line work in your yard. So, you know, put a dominant dog collar on them and a 15 foot long line and just practice turns. So you go this way and then you make a hard 180 and you go the opposite, you know, direction. And you're just going to be meandering around your yard, just getting him to follow you rather than just so being so fixated and that's really good for dogs that are so frustrated and pent up right these dogs who are just uh, like this all the time they're used to only having like this much room on the leash so when you give them more room on the leash they can actually make better choices and the great thing is if if they're the kind of dog that redirects which most of these dogs are they stop redirecting because you give them more room on the leash so that's something i should have mentioned earlier these types of dogs that are real jumpy like this I give them way more room on the leash, right? I give them, a lot of times I'll give them eight, 10 feet on the leash. And, you know, there's a natural, there, there's a natural, natural opposition reflex that these dogs have, which just means if you choke up on them and, and you don't give them much uh, leash to, to go with, they're constantly feeling that pressure on their neck, which just agitates them even more. So I'll give them lots of room on the leash. And a lot of times, you know, they just have a little bit more room to breathe a little bit and walk back forth a little bit more. And they tend to get a lot less reactive just by giving them more room in the leash. Um, to speak to the point of using food here, sometimes I do use food. And I know a lot of balance trainers in this context would say, oh, that's stupid. The dog is over arousal. You shouldn't be using food and whatever. But trust me, I've done it with lots of dogs in the past where it's like, OK, yes, my brain says don't use food. That's going to make the dog excited in a situation like this because that's counter to what you're doing and trying to get the dog to calm down. But you can, if, if that dog is very food motivated and you take a bunch of his food and you throw it on the ground and he's got to take 20, 30 seconds to eat it while another dog is walking by and he's, and he's not fixating on that other dog, or maybe the client only uses, you know, the food spreading in a context where it's like, Oh crap, somebody just came out of their house. Like the dog is emergency scenario, it can be really helpful, but um, but typically I don't like using food in situations where the dog is too over wraps. That's just personal opinion because if you don't do it right, you know it can kind of cause some other issues. Cool. All right, let's do one more question here, and then we're going to wrap it up for the evening, guys. I know Ted's got to get running. He's got children that have to get to bed. I've got children that have to get to bed. Um, we had another question come in here that I thought was really great. And this comes from Beverly on YouTube. And she says, uh, Ted, what does a typical first day with an aggressive dog look like in your board and train program? Well, honestly, I don't do board and trains. I haven't done them in many years because I honestly don't like doing board and trains. And I really don't like cleaning up diarrhea at three o'clock in the morning. So I've chosen not to do board and trains or Lobo's puke, by the way. Um, but having said that, I did board and trains for a long time. And I will tell you this. Um, it is it is. The dog sleeps in a crate because that's just the safest thing to do. In the morning, 
I would wake up, I would take the dog out, I'd let him use the bathroom, I would take his food with him, I would have him work for his food, you know, seriously, like walk down my driveway, come here, Rover, eat a bit of your food. Okay, go up, keep going, whatever. And he would just work for his food. If he didn't want to work for his food, boom, food is gone. That's the only way that you eat. You go back inside, not three, four times a day like that. And it's just literally one week. The only way that dog goes outside is to use the bathroom and to go outside and get himself fed by coming to me and getting food. That's it. And there's also a little a little bit of going to be also given when the dog goes in the crate because I want the dog running in the crate having fun doing that. That's basically week one. And then week and then second week, I would typically start e-collar conditioning the dog and actually start doing some obedience training, which is just, you know, proofing the dog's recall, uh, training the dog to go on place, which is really the only obedience command that I teach. Uh, come in place. Um, I don't teach down or anything, you know, extra like that. Uh, and, and then week three, we, uh, start working on, you know, leash reactivity, uh, start socializing him around other dogs. I typically start with a fence in between and kind of go from there. And then, um, week four, typically I'm just cleaning things up, you know, getting the dog off leash, off leash socialization around other dogs, people taking them into the city and all that kind of stuff. Uh, typically most of my board trains used to be about four weeks. I personally do not like rehabilitation board and trains less than four weeks because I don't think that they happen to be completely frank. Uh, you can't rehabilitate an aggressive dog in two weeks. I don't care who says it. You can do a component of it, but you're not doing it in two weeks. You can do it in four to five and you can do it in five to six if you really know what you're doing, but you can't do it in two weeks. Um, and so that's literally it. I, it's, it's very boring. Uh, the dog does very little work with me. I do not work them four or five times a day. I work them twice a day and then there's some pee breaks. Um, and it is 10 minute sessions a day. That's, that's basically it. You got to work for everything. So that's, that's kind of how it is. If you're interested in, in seeing that further, you can check out my, he's not friendly DVD series that I did three or four years ago. Um, there was four dogs that went through it they did a board train with me you can see them go from start to finish everything that i did with them uh you can get that on uh thriving with dog uh you can find all that stuff um but yeah that's that's the way that i do it i know there's lots of different ways to do board and trains but i'm all about less is more man i just do the stuff that moves the needle anybody's inter in, into business knows about the Pareto principle, the 80-20 principle. I would rather spend, you know, spend a little bit of time doing stuff that is actually going to move the needle rather than just trying to just work the dog hour after hour after hour and not, you know, get very far. I just do stuff that actually makes a difference. Getting that dog to understand that everything has to be worked for, right? That that I am the, you know, the 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 purveyor of of freedom and food and interaction social interaction i use i used to use a bit of isolation right like you're not in just hanging out with me in my office right you got to be in my loft in a kennel behind a you know and a Mozart, right so that when you come you know you're you're fresh to that dog and that dog goes oh man you've been gone for five hours where were you i want to go inside let's do some work right but a lot of trainers don't do that in their board and trains. They just integrate the dog so much in their lifestyle and the dog is just like they're at camp. I don't think that that is very helpful in a rehabilitation. It doesn't, it's, it, it works, but it works a lot quicker if the dog has a little bit of isolation and time to think and process. That's just the way I think about it. Cool. All right. Well, Ted, I know you've got this masterclass coming up. Um, and obviously we've got so many questions on here that we were not able to get to. Um, and of course you get a lot of people that just say, Hey, how do I stop my dog from being aggressive towards people? And that's of course, well beyond the scope of what we can cover in, in, um, this kind of just a live event. Um, and also I, I just want to mention, you know, again, briefly, we talked about this before, but guys, remember if you are not if, if, uh, experienced working with aggression, don't just jump in and do it, especially just because you listened to somebody's YouTube video or to our live chat, 
I mean, really, you want to spend some time getting familiar. And I think a great place to start is doing a class such as the one that Ted is putting on starting on Thursday. Ted, why don't you tell us a little bit about what that class is, what people can expect, the format of it, et cetera. Yeah, so we're starting on the 23rd. Today's Tuesday, so that's Thursday. And it is a five-week master class. It's called Dog Aggression Decoded. And basically every week I do an hour of teaching and then we have an hour of Q&A. So uh, we start with the foundations, right? Understanding the difference between reactivity and aggression, all of these basic things, you know, how to learn how to read dogs better, how to prepare yourself. We talk about safety, all that kind of stuff in week one. And then week two, we come into it and we start talking about, you know, working through leash reactivity and then we go the next week we go through dog aggression and then we go through human aggression and the final week we go through resource guarding now you can do this if you're a dog trainer you can also do this if you're a dog owner and you want to learn more about aggression the great thing is you can ask questions about your own dog or your client's dog you can post videos on the on the facebook page that we have and i will look at them and read through and and show you exactly what you should be doing with your own dog or another uh, or, or a client's dog that you have. And for the trainers, they can also seek certification. So they can do, they have to do a test and they have to send in before and after videos uh, of them working with dogs and they can get certification through the course. So I've done this, this is my third round of doing it. And we've had lots of trainers go through it and uh, we'd love to have more dog owners go through it and get some help uh, for themselves as well. For the trainers that are going to be doing this, I will send out also Thriving Dog Trainers, which is one of my books, which is for uh, people who are dog trainers who want to learn how to get to the next level in their dog training business. So I'll be sending those out to anybody who signs up uh, through Tyler's link to the course. But it's it's the most information I've seen anywhere on dog aggression right so dog aggression human aggression everything that goes along with that the last time we did this course there was over 10 hours of q a and videos and stuff there's supplemented stuff you get you know you get free pdf books that you can read i've written seven books you get video courses that i've gone through all kinds of good stuff and right now it's only 340 dollars to go through that whole program and you can the great thing is if you can't miss if you miss one of the lives you can just come back in at another time and uh, watch the videos you don't have to be live for every one of them if you're putting your kids to bed or something like that you can join anytime or check them out at a later time and if you want to go for the certification you got a whole year to do it you don't have to do it right away you can take your time to do it and uh, and that's basically it so it's if you want to learn about aggressive dogs, you're not going to find a, a place where you're going to learn more about aggressive dogs online. I'll tell you that much. Cool. So, yeah, it's, this is a, it's, a, it's a virtual program, which means it doesn't matter where you are, especially right now. Obviously, nobody's able to travel and you don't need to um, for this program, which is why it's such a nice thing to get involved in right now. Um, and then I have posted the link to it in several places throughout the comments here. Um, I'll post again sort of as we're wrapping up, so you guys have access to that link. And just in case you didn't catch that, Ted's going to send you a free copy of one of his books as well, which is a nice um, sort of extra bonus for you guys also. Um, so yeah, so Ted, thank you so much for, for joining me tonight. This is great. I'm glad we were able to kind of help get the word out about your program. I think it's a great thing. And um, definitely thank you, everybody who uh, was sort of in the, the virtual audience tonight and contributing questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every question that's out there. Um, but you know, we try our best to, to touch on a bunch of different topics. Um, so yeah, Ted, man, it's been a blast and hopefully we'll be able to see each other in person sometime soon. Yes, my friend, it was great. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all your questions, everybody. I, I appreciate, uh, the fact that you guys would come and, uh, and just, uh, I, I always get so jazzed up that people actually want to learn about dogs and dog training. So I, I really appreciate all the time that you guys have spent here. Cool. All right, guys, have a great night.